Yes, yes, yes. The threat hunting gods are blessing me today. The threat hunter in the organization has the most value because he's going to go after what his boss cares about. He's going to go after the vectors that attackers use to either exfiltrate data, that sensitive data, those credit cards, those company secrets. And he's going to go after vectors that hackers use to propagate ransomware and all of that. The two big ones. Enough said. Let's get into it. I want to know exactly what event types they have server or host first network second meaning that i want to start from the endpoint and move outward i don't want to find a network artifact and go into server or workstation it doesn't make any sense like that and you're going to get lost so you're going to click host mod windows for them dealing with event types and what events are called that's all on the organization and what they want to name things for you. You need to determine what event type is most relevant to workstation or server based activity. Now we want to look at processes and the processes that ran because you have to propagate malware from a process or a processes library or module. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click type and I'm going to click process. I see WMI PRV SE and I'll tell you right now, this is the binary that runs WMI command or WMI commands and WMI commands are very insidious. They are very effective when APTs, when hackers want to enumerate a server or workstation effectively and efficiently. Actual good guys can use the same binary as well. So just keeping that in mind, but this is interesting to us. Outlook is interesting to us because people use Outlook to download malware. They'll load up Outlook and then they'll get fish. And then that's how malware is sometimes introduced to the environment. So we want to keep that in mind as well. So when we're doing workstation based or server based hunting, it's very important to identify binaries as we go through the data. For beginners, you're going to have to Google everything. But as you work with the data over the years, you'll start to recognize binaries that you've seen in the past and the process is a lot smoother. So what we want to do is take the command line and get the rare values. I don't want it in a visualization. I want it in statistics. There we go. So when word.exe, so it's a potential, it's likely that the person that downloaded Outlook opened winword.exe. So even though advanced persistent threats and advanced hackers are very adept at blending in to make their traffic seem normal, when they gain initial access, it's inevitable that they'll produce unique artifacts. So on our end, we need to organize the command line events from rarest to most common so that we can see those rare events at the top. Organizing things from rare to most common is a common technique for threat hunters. Yes, yes, yes. The threat hunting gods are blessing me today. It's not 100% certain, but you can bet that this command was run with a script. So we're gonna write that down as well, cmd.exe and then C net stat and then in AO and then find STR R. Now there's a few things that make this suspicious. The fact that there's a slash C on it, which means that that was probably run in a script, the NAO, because typically network administrators are not that advanced to put tech NAO on it. Like, yeah, you have some, but I'm talking about the typical network administrator is, you know, not going to be that fancy with that stat. And then to pipe that in the fine string. Yeah. All of this is what you have to take into account when you're hunting. Another thing that's going to directly impact your success as a threat hunter is your ability to attack. So learning how penetration testers do things, learning ethical hacking is going to give you that leg up as you can test and run scenarios that will produce those artifacts that you can watch out for when you're actually doing your job threat hunting.
So maybe instead of 20, we want to do 100. Oh, rare limit. Let's change rare limit to 100. So the thing about seams is you're going to work with a lot of seams during your career. You have to be able to jump on a seam and learn it rather quickly. There's a lot of tasks eng.exe. And so what we could do is say, okay, that worked. We have a ping 8.8.8.8, .8 which will, that's a little suspicious, but we'll leave it alone for now. We do have a PowerShell and encoded PowerShell. So we have encoded PowerShell in here as well. We have C script, might be legitimate and regular, but again, you know, who knows? Audit, bat. These things are like, if, if there was red, yellow, and green, they'd be yellow to me. But PowerShell, encoded PowerShell, that's red to me, which means that I definitely believe that's malicious. What else? Um, I don't see anything else that's interesting. So it looks like that is probably a red on my radar. That is a yellow on my radar. That's a red. Then I think that's going to be it. This is, this has no command line arguments. So we don't know yet for that. So that's a yellow. So I hope you see what I did there. It takes a little bit of windows expertise to you know go through that first. So now that we have our processes that we believe are malicious, we need to organize these artifacts in chronological order so we can tell the story. WMI PRV. Actually, we have to do this to make it neater. WMI PRV SC.exe. And see if that comes up. Yes. We say or Outlook EXE. Or when word exe. Or CMD exe. Or net stat. That exe or powershell.exe and this is gonna it should make um create a timeline of occurrences that makes sense let's go to command line and so there's a lot of wmi traffic so uh we're going to, need to bless off on that and say that is legitimate so we're going to exclude that i'm telling you you can do some damage with that you're going to type enter and then we'll see what we get now. We're not worried about that. It looks like they ran Splunk with a script, which is fine. That's not that's not malicious or anything like that. Interrupting this program to say, if you like what you see, please like and consider subscribing. Let's get back into it. Um, so this is our the first encoded PowerShell that we see here. What we could do is we could take this out. Copy. And then we can take this to, I don't know, command line. Let's say echo this block, this blob, and pipe that in the base 64D. Enter. Now, another reason why it's important to have attacker skills and abilities when you threat hunt is you see things like this. You see payloads that are clearly from either PowerShell Empire or a Cobalt Strike. And when you identify these, you can immediately raise up the red flag and say, hey, boss, this is malicious. We need to investigate this workstation or server, maybe triage it, maybe re-image it, or maybe continue the threat. So IP address, where is it? Where are you IP address? 45. 77, 65, 211 on 443. So 348, something happened. Let's see if we have any more encoded PowerShell. 4348 on 824.17. Yeah, it's 338. Something happened at 338 as well. So maybe because that's very similar. Because 
The one that I saw before was at 348.13, and this one is at 338.12. So that may be a beacon or some kind of exfiltration. So we have command line app data local temp invoice doc. So the plot thickens at 338.12. What? Oh, so 338.12, and then that's probably the first beacon or whatever the case. So what we could do is say, uh, so Billy Ton is our pro is our probable uh, compromised user. We don't know that yet. We're just deducing from what we have here, but we can be highly suspicious of that. So, yeah. Let's see if there are any malicious things happening before that. Yeah, so it's not showing me what was downloaded with Outlook. So yeah, we can go ahead and exclude Outlook and focus on WinWord. Yeah, that is, um, I think, Cobalt Strike, if I'm not mistaken. Either that or, um, or Empire, PowerShell Empire. Let me see that. That's their pers persistence. 338.12 was the initial access. 338.12 initial access. So from there, from there, you can definitely say this is when the ransomware started. And you also try to get that document to do some forensics on it. So that's a thing too. Uh, what we could also do is uh, Three minutes of nearby events. Let's do apply. And then let's erase all of this stuff because now that we know what happened, we can start to say, okay, let's, let's get a bigger picture of what happened. So we don't want processes anymore. Now at this point in your hunt, you need to change your scope from workstation slash server based to network based. But what we should be looking for here is 45.77.65.11. We have the traffic here. So when it is encrypted, what you can do is look for something called a JA3 hash. I don't think I see it. Maybe it's this. I don't know. Maybe they got it worded weirdly, but JA3 hash is a fingerprint for a server. Um, that oh, SSL that SSL traffic uses. So you want to get that information. I highly suspect it to be this one. So I would take this and then call it the J3 hash. And so I'd block communication by that. You can basically say add to search. And now you have all of the malicious communication with that server. So obviously this was a phishing attack, but I guarantee you phishing attacks have advanced by far. These days, an attacker may send you an ISO or an executable that's hidden with an LNK file or a shortcut file that activates these executables. And once that occurs, there's a malicious DLL also hidden just waiting to be uploaded. When that user clicks that LNK file, we call this phishing using DLL sideloading. I can explain to you how this works in great detail if you click the video that just popped up for you.